the new Century Adult Detention Center in Johnson County, Kansas, just southwest of Kansas City. Its jail complex is state-of-the-art. In addition to the computerized system, cameras help monitor the inmates and manage their every move. In control centers like this one, detainees are under continuous surveillance. We have 12 screens that are in constant rotation of the modules in this building and also uh, the perimeter of this building. Cameras are so high tech that you can basically pull in on a car across the bridge on the other side and take in a tag. Kind of gives us an extra edge. The building perimeter, hallways, inside the cells, and in day rooms. The cameras see everything. With touchscreen technology, the computers help control who gets in and who gets out. We have officers working in this facility that are able to open, shut doors. They can literally control an entire situation from another building. Lockdown, lockdown. At this time, the facility locked down and conduct a formal head count. Sheriff's deputies oversee the inmates with an iron fist. They respond swiftly and sharply to even the smallest infraction. These guys aren't coddled by any means. If you try something, I'm going to better it, that kind of thing. They know how it runs. For some, the harsh discipline and high-tech security make this county jail tougher than any prison. This is the worst jail to be in. This Johnson County is supposed to be one of the richest counties in the nation, and they treat you so bad here. This is a terrible jail to be in. We're basically trying to, trying to break you for real, which it does break some people. The stress of being here can push some detainees over the edge. That's what happens in November 2009, when a simple card game turns into a violent brawl. A surveillance camera captures it on tape. Inmates Roger Mills and Richard Gilchrist are playing cards with two others when Mills becomes angry and accuses Gilchrist of cheating. I kept telling him I wasn't, but he didn't take it. I mean, he just didn't believe me. Oh. And he got mad about it, and he jumped up on me, and we started fighting. Took me down a couple times, he delivered a bunch of savage blows in my head. I got hit at least half a dozen times in the head. Deputy Charles Adele is on duty. I heard a scrummage going on over there, and uh, two inmates is fighting. So I got up, ordered the module to lock down, and called a code 200. A code 200 signals an inmate on inmate fight and calls out any available deputy to respond. It was probably one of the better fights I've seen while I've been here. Um, as far as it was a pretty good match, both inmates throwing punches, it wasn't one on top of the other. Deputy Adele waits for backup. He orders the other detainees to return to their cells. As soon as more deputies arrive, Gilchrist gives up the fight. When I see him coming in the door, I'd stop and walk away. I didn't want him to tase me. A taser delivers a powerful jolt of electricity. It's painful and debilitating. Inmates know officers will tase them and more. If there's a fight in here, they're going to bring about 40 cops in here. They're going to tase you. They're going to mace you. They're going to put slam you down in a chair, and everybody's going to go lock down. Gilchrist doesn't want to risk those severe consequences. So I just got out of there and just walked over and let him cut me up. As punishment, both men get 20 days in the hole. That's disciplinary segregation when they're locked up for 23 hours a day in a maximum security module. Both of those inmates as well are on a full restraint order, which means they don't come out of their cell without handcuffs and shackles. Inmates end up in maximum, medium, or minimum security modules based on their behavior in jail, not their alleged crimes. Accused murderers and rapists can be mixed in with petty criminals. Johnson County spends big money to be on the cutting edge of jail technology. Most recently, with a $54 million addition at New Century. The expansion means New Century can now take on hundreds of new inmates from an older jail. 
transfer will be the first operation of its kind for the deputies, beginning with the most dangerous and unstable detainees, those in maximum security. One of them is 20-year-old Brian McHenry, charged with theft and driving on a suspended license. McHenry has a history of refusing to cooperate. Officers suspect he may be mentally unbalanced. On this day, he won't come out of his cell for a shower. We need to have you come out and take a shower. It's one of our general guidelines. You must shower at least three times a week. Regular showers help stop the spread of lice and disease, such as hepatitis. Concerned about McHenry's mental state, the deputies move in slowly and carefully. Then escort a handcuffed and silent McHenry into a shower room. Jam up the wall. But after several minutes, he still refuses to cooperate. If you don't take a shower, okay, we'll have to do that for you. You understand? There's no response at all. Let's get that hose. The deputies bring in a garden hose and make their move with force. Kenry, put your hands up on the wall, please. Turn around, put your hands Turn around, put your hands Finally, after being restrained by three officers, McHenry is stripped down and washed. But then, deputies make a discovery. Uh, can you go call the nurse one and come on? Something is sticking out from between McHenry's buttocks. And it could be dangerous. Inmates who make homemade weapons, or shanks, sometimes hide them in body orifices. Medical is brought in. It looks like it's part of the razor. I don't know. Are you serious? But you guys are nurses, I don't know. <sighs> okay. It's not what they suspect. What is this? Okay. Pencil. What? But is it like just, just now? now? We don't know. Alright. You just throw down here in the corner because we're gonna have this clean. Okay. Coming up, sheriff's deputies take on a high-risk operation in the transfer of maximum security inmates. When that door is open, nobody is coming in. And later, cameras catch an inmate whose repulsive actions threaten his entire cell block. This is at the Adult Detention Center in Olathe, Kansas. A critical operation is in progress. Deputies are moving the maximum security inmates from here to the state-of-the-art New Century Jail in Gardner, Kansas, 11 miles away. It's the first phase of the eventual transfer of all the 260 Olathe inmates, so that facility can be shut down and renovated. In moving the detainees, authorities are taking no chances. A tactical police team gears up, armed with restraints, tasers, and rifles that shoot plastic bullets. They're members of the Sheriff's Emergency Response Team, or CERT. These officers are trained to quickly put down any kind of inmate resistance. Inmate Slager, I'm asking you to lay on the floor with your head toward the wall and your feet toward the door. Do you understand? Drop the shank. During training drills like this one, they run through scenarios for storming a cell and removing uncooperative inmates. One, two, three. Up. They know we mean business when we, when we come in to deal with the situation. We're not here to play. It's an intimidating show of force, and it provides a valuable backup for the deputies involved in today's transfer. Another deterrent? Inmates won't be told they're being moved to New Century. We are concerned about how they will react to changing their world because they get into a, a rhythm and a system and to change that really messes them up and they will go kicking and screaming sometimes if they don't like it. 
Among the potentially violent inmates is Brian McHenry, who fought with deputies overtaking a shower. And there's this man, 20-year-old Fawaz Al Said. His calm demeanor belies a violent history. The Iraqi immigrant is finishing a sentence for aggravated assault after firing a gun at someone during a dispute. While in custody, he's caused trouble. Some of it, he says, is due to the isolation of lockdown. You stay in your room all day and, you know, you get an hour out. You know, it gets you, like, trip out sometimes. Al Said has lost it repeatedly. In one incident, he tries to climb under his bunk and won't come out. You want to get up on your bench, please? Nurse is going to come in and see you. They don't like to grab you until you have Al Said still refuses to move, so a nurse checks him and determines he's okay. As deputies pull him out, he wails in Arabic. He's taken from his cell and put in a restraint chair. Al Said ends up in the hole. And it's not long before he's at it again. I was still doing chaos. I was, you know, messing with the cops, flooding my toilet. During the incident, Al Said smears his excrement on his cell wall in the shape of a well-known symbol for anarchy. This time, deputies go in wearing hazard suits, forcing him out of his cell and into a shower. To the officers, it appears that he had actually tried to eat his own excrement. Al Said, what's happening this time? Hmm? What's causing you to eat your own feces? I'm hungry, man. You're hungry? Yeah. I grew up my whole life a troublemaker, but, you know, it's true what they say, jail just changed change people. He may claim he's changed, but on this day, authorities take no risks with anyone. While the sheriff's emergency response team takes up positions outside. All right, man, go to your post and we'll wait for their orders. In the maximum security unit, one by one, the inmates are cuffed, shackled, and removed from their cells. The transfer goes without a hitch until the deputies get to the cell of 26-year-old inmate Jose Solis. Get on your paw. Since his arrest in 2006 for the murder of his ex-girlfriend, he's had numerous run-ins with the staff. You move and you're getting taken. Here, officers extract him from his cell. You guys don't need to be doing this Another confrontation lands Solis in a restraint chair. Wait. Now, when the deputies tell him to get up from his bunk, he won't budge. Solis demands to know where he's going. They reveal little. I have to evacuate this module. I need to get, it, get dressed. Deputies wait to see if Solis will comply. But given his history of violence, they still anticipate a struggle. After several minutes, the standoff ends peacefully and Solis is escorted downstairs. As officers stand guard, more than two dozen inmates are put onto buses, still not knowing where they're headed or for how long. Coming up, Realization about the transfer sparks some angry reactions from the detainees. You, I'm talking to you. You wonder why people act up. Including one who has a history of confrontation. And later, a man high on meth takes police on a wild high-speed chase, while another addict has a rough night in lockup. It's, it's New Century Adult Detention Center in Gardner, Kansas, is one of the most cutting-edge jails in the country. Step up. On this day, the deputies are in the middle of a dangerous transport. They're moving dozens of maximum security inmates to New Century from a jail in nearby Olathe that's being shut down for renovation. The detainees have no idea where they're going. Once they do find out, 
There's concern they'll react with violence. Left turn. Inmates make the final walk to their new cells. Realization begins to sink in. They're going from one maximum security unit to another. 12-year veteran Deputy Greg Smith does his best to make the move as smooth as possible. Well, are we going to get like down lockdown again? Or the line? Oh, heck no. I thought we were going to be better. Like, are we going to get out at all? Like, they said six hours over there. To get We're going to explain all the rules to you when you get in here on exactly how it works. Okay. I just got out of all that. It's like crap over there. Like, I mean, it sucks. But this is brand new. 25-year-old Jeremy Valadez has already shown he can be unpredictable and volatile. On the night of his arrest, just days earlier, he raised hell for deputies. Once I got to the jail, I was acting bad, you know, like, I wasn't acting like me, like I was talking crap to the guards. Come here, little Just give me that Give me that Valadez says he was on a drug and booze binge the night he was brought in, after fleeing the police during a traffic stop. Give me that We're going all the way through to cell three. You ain't taking my clothes, bitch. Yeah, I beg you, Dave. You all I would say that he probably ran the gamut of what can happen to you in this facility. And he's very agitated, wound up, starts calling the name. Apparently, uh, there's a lot of mooning going on and a lot of suggestive talking throughout that. The deputies have a very low tolerance for any kind of misbehavior, including his torrent of foul language and flashes of nudity. They escort him to a disciplinary cell. It's known as the rubber room, a padded cell for those who are detoxing from drugs or alcohol, or could be a threat. Oh my God, where's the mattress? Now. When you decide you want to quit running your mouth and being an annoying distraction, we'll come back and get you. Hey, Mister, give me that white okay? After hearing three hours of non-stop trash talking, the officers are fed up and decide to restrain Valadez. Yeah, you're gonna laugh, but I'm telling you what, you turn, I will tase you. They storm his cell. Arm. Get in. I will tase you. You understand me? Then you should have been at the window yelling and pounding. Do you understand me? I did not come back to play. So I ended up being put in a restraint chair. They put a mask on you, like a, a nylon mask, so you can't spit on them or bite them or anything while they're trying to secure you. As he's strapped in, Valadez argues with the deputies. When you start running your mouth, remember, you it's have, your behavior that hey, got you here, not mine. You have a bean hole, honey. You can put my hands out there and handcuff me. That's the prison style. If you don't got security like that, get it together. You're still talking, aren't you? But who's sitting in the chair? Me. Exactly. Now, as Valadez and the others get their first look at their new cells, they don't like what they see. I'm a little feller, but uh, I don't even think I could sleep on that little mattress. Kind of small. This little room right here is our outdoor rec. It's like four times smaller than the rec area that we had back at the other, other jail. This rec area is hella small. Jeremy Valadez can't contain his frustration and anger. With a 23-hour-a-day lockdown, Valadez and the others will have little freedom. Oh, that's so fun. For the time being, they're not allowed to have any personal belongings, and they're closely monitored by the deputies and video cameras. We've got certain cells that are uh, videotaped all the time for the ones that are more of a problem. Jeremy Valadez is in one of those cells under constant surveillance. One week later, another inmate ends up here in a cell with a camera after a sickening attack. 29-year-old Antonio Gutierrez is charged with a parole violation. 
Soon after arriving at New Century, he decides to settle a score with another inmate who had reported him for smoking marijuana. He ain't gonna snitch on me, but I don't give a no with snitches. So I was smart enough, I was ready, already waiting. The cameras are rolling while the attack unfolds. As the inmates are allowed out of their cells for lunch, Gutierrez makes his move. Just after his enemy leaves his cell, Gutierrez walks up carrying his own feces in a cup. Then, slipping out of view under the balcony, he hurls it through the open cell door. I want to open the door. There you go, all his I mean, from pictures, from food, from everything. There you go, that's what you eat, that's what you deserve to eat. That's what snitches get. He lucky he didn't got stitches. Even though this attack occurred just beyond the camera's reach, deputies are still able to use the video to figure out when it occurred and who's responsible. A few hours later, they storm Gutierrez's cell, remove him, and throw him in the hole. Now he's furious because he's in a cell with a camera. Why well, you gotta have a camera when... I got, I got a bathroom here, man. You wanna be watching my ass every time? You know what I mean? That's what they do. Tell them, man, they better get me the out of here. They're gonna go down back again. I don't care. I don't like cameras here. Within hours, Gutierrez makes good on his threat to cause trouble, even as the camera in his cell captures it all on tape. This time, he causes the toilets to overflow. I told the man, flushing. He flushed, he flushed. The guy's not flushed. I told him, coming out. Within minutes, toilet water and human waste cover the floor. It forces the evacuation of several inmates from their cells. Gutierrez is among the loudest, howling to get out. This is real biohazard, man. And this motherfucker don't get me out of here. It's thick. Look, it's fing in here. He keeps up his tirade as officers move him out. That ain't fair, man. That's some shit all over, man. His victory is short lived. Gutierrez ends up back in a cell with a camera within a week. Coming up, a high-speed chase lands a suspect in high-tech court. Yes, Your Honor. And later, deputies work frantically to save the life of a suicidal man. James, Come on, shy, hey, shy. wake up! Whitmore, you are Mr. Whitmore? Yes, Your Honor. Welcome to what could be the jail of tomorrow. This is Video Court, one of the many high-tech innovations at the New Century Jail in Kansas. On this day, 28-year-old Joshua Whitmore is among many defendants appearing here. He's facing two felony charges. His arraignment is done through video conferencing, with Whitmore standing before a screen and the judge in a courthouse several miles away. This remote procedure saves on transportation and security costs. It's quick and efficient. Charge of felony fleeing and looting a law enforcement officer and felony theft. Bond is set at $50,000 cash surety with no alcohol, no drugs. Bond supervision through court services and no driving, period. You understand that, sir? Yes, Your Honor. Whitmore was arrested after this high-speed police chase caught on camera. It happened when the cops tried to pull him over for a traffic violation, and instead, he took off. For several hours, he attempted to outrun authorities, winding his way through four counties before finally giving up. He blames the wild ride on too much meth. I don't know what happened other than it was just stupid, and I was real high. I mean, it was just ignorant to keep driving it around. I guess I could say I was out of my mind completely. This man also wound up here in a haze. And in this new digital jail, he's about to find out how technology can reveal the ugly truth. 47-year-old Glenn Shipley is charged with marijuana possession. When he's brought in, it appears to Deputy Greg Smith that he's under the influence of another drug. 
Try to stand still for me. Look right up here at this box. Smith confirms his suspicions with a digital fingerprinting machine. It's called LiveScan, and it can detect marks not visible to the human eye. Mm -hmm. Where are all these rings on your finger? Huh. <laughs> Where'd you get them from? I uh, can't really see them. Oh, yeah, they show up on here, man. Those rings are a sign of the burns that meth users can get when they use their finger to cover the open end of a glass pipe. Him looks like he's got a lot of burn marks, a lot of circle marks. Um, he's tweaking pretty bad right now, so more likely it's meth. The digital fingerprint machine will also find out if someone is wanted for other crimes. LiveScan is linked in real time to the state police and the FBI's criminal databases. This young man, brought in for driving under the influence, will undergo the fingerprinting process, but it won't be easy. He's having a very rough night. Why out, talk to the nurse. I'm not a violent person. Ruben Leva is coming down from a bad high. I don't feel like spiders are on Oh. It's, it's... Please. Carolyn. Carolyn. What else? PCP. Anything else? Ecstasy. Cocaine. Once he finally gets booked, Leva's prints will be used to keep track of him in the jail. Inmates here can't use even the phone without first scanning their fingerprint, and calls are recorded. Personal visits are limited too by video technology. Detainees sit before a camera and TV screen and talk by telephone with visitors in a different part of the building. The inmates hate it. I don't want you to be tired. My mom would be in, in the jail, in the facility, but it's like she's so far away, you know what I mean? Like, come way out here just to see me on the screen. I'd rather see her in person, you know what I mean? You look good, Mijo. It's uh, not a very intimate setting to see your son or daughter, mother, father, significant other through a video screen. They do not like these video visits at all. Deputy Cynthia Zack oversees a minimum security module where another innovative practice is used for further control. It's called direct supervision. This unique elevated station allows her to safely interact with inmates but still keep close watch. With detainees in here from alleged murderers to rapists, the computerized platform helps the deputy keep track of their movements. And this is what we do, our logging. Like any kind of activity goings on, we have to log in here. And if an inmate does leave the module, she will pat them down. Basically, looking for anything that they should be taken. Spread them up a little bit. Thank you. We are on these guys every minute that they're out and about. We do not want any of them to ever think that they're in control. That's the worst thing any officer can do for these fellows. Sometimes only physical contact will control a situation. When inmates are brought in kicking and screaming. I don't give a about it. Coming up, deputies go head to head with another volatile detainee and race to save a man's life. Johnson County's high-tech New Century Jail is notorious throughout Kansas for its strict control. In early 2009, Percy Freeman is brought into the jail on a rampage. I don't give a f about it. I've never been in a county jail like this in my life. Well, I guess they think that we were supposed to just bow down to them, but some of us ain't gonna do it. He's fully restrained following a confrontation with the sheriff's deputies. Now, what the f do you want me to do? And trying desperately to talk his way out of his situation. Man, f restraints. Take this off my head. Okay, brother. Man, listen, man. Yeah, okay. okay. Freeman just served 16 years in prison for attempted murder. 
He's only been out a year before ending up back behind bars on charges of domestic violence. Freeman, you need to steal your bunk. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. Good. Okay, but please, I do not want to touch it. These officers are going to be the ones that they can hook you up and you're going to have to cooperate with what they're doing. While his anger is building, he holds back. For now, an attack on an officer means more hard time. I already know if you put your hand on the guard, you're going to get 10 years. Man, don't nobody want to do 10 years, but don't nobody want to sit up here and be treated like no dog either. The stress, Freeman says, is taking a serious toll. I mean, they got, they got some people here that don't need to be in maximum jail. Some people done killed themselves in here. Deputies here are aware that suicide's a real risk. The cameras help monitor the inmates, but even so, the officers have to be vigilant. Deputy Christopher Toski is specially trained in suicide prevention. A lot of people don't know this, but jails rank number one in the country for suicide. Prison ranks number nine. So it gives you a real uh, example of how serious of a, a suicide problem can be in a jail setting. The staff does constant checks to make sure the inmates are okay. You gonna eat? In October 2009, an officer on rounds makes a shocking discovery. The officer happened to come across the room or look into the room when the inmate was uh, in the process of hanging himself. Inmate James Shivers is in his cell, hanging from a homemade noose around his neck. The deputy calls a code 900 which signals a medical emergency. Deputy Emily Craighead is among the first to arrive. We couldn't get a heartbeat, breaths, anything. I'm calling for the sergeants to get a hold of med act right there. As they wait for paramedics, the deputies keep working furiously on shivers. Jail nurses arrive. They attach an airbag to help him breathe and a defibrillator to give the heart a jolt of electricity while the officers help with chest compressions. This is where I started doing compressions. I did not think that we were going to get him to come back. Finally, after several minutes, a sign of life. Okay, take a breath. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Take a breath. After a few more compressions, a pulse. Feel it? Feel it through my hand. Feel it through my hand? Yep, cool. strong. He's got a pulse. They rub his sternum and call out his name, hoping he'll come too. James, 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 James. Hey, wake up. And then another deeper breath. There, there we go, there we go. Come on, buddy. Come on, James. When the paramedics arrive a few moments later, James Shivers is breathing on his own. It's been 15 minutes since the code was called. He's rushed to the hospital. He left with a heartbeat, so we're happy with that. That's great, for sure. Even more remarkable, within a few weeks, James Shivers is out of the hospital. He's put in a green suit known as a suicide smock. It's designed without elastic or other materials inmates could use to harm themselves. Yeah, I've gradually been getting a lot of my memory back, but they said I was in a hospital, I was in a coma, they said I had no brain activity. He faces a variety of domestic violence charges, which he says led to his suicide attempt. I was just building up, having so many court dates because they have like all my charges spread out through that courthouse. I feel like I can't keep track of all these cases. It's just like a big mess. Suicide attempts remind deputies about the importance of closely observing the inmate's behavior. Even the best surveillance technology can't detect signs of depression and other mental health problems. Such is the case involving inmate Linda Rupert, known as a frequent flyer because she keeps ending up in jail. The 41-year-old Rupert, facing charges of telephone harassment, is being uncooperative. She's being removed from her cell and transferred to another area. Deputies warn her to calm down or else. Relax. Put your hands in the chair. All right. 
You guys are look like Nazis more and more. Have to be quiet, okay? You look Nazi. You're a Nazi for doing this to me. But the move does little to pacify her. It smells like piss in here. Now you cannot have me here. Someone pissed in here. Moments later, when deputies discover she's flooded her cell with water from the sink, they decide it's time for the restraint chair. Walk out backwards. Finally, Linda Rupert quiets down. Her behavior leads to a transfer out of jail to a mental health facility for a full evaluation. Coming up, strict discipline does little to stop Jeremy Valadez from lashing out. And deputies rush to take down another volatile inmate. The New Century Jail in Johnson County, Kansas. He's one of the most sophisticated and tightly controlled facilities in the country. Anyone who gets out of line will be brought down and removed. 25-year-old inmate Jeremy Valadez has learned that the hard way. Since being transferred to this new maximum security unit, he's had some big run-ins with the deputies. One confrontation, caught by cameras, occurs after Valadez is told his phone time was up. He makes the mistake of trying to argue with the deputy. Before anything can possibly get out of control, Valadez is stomped right in his tracks. Once again, the deputy shows zero tolerance for insubordination. He slammed me on the ground and I was like just laid there and didn't resist. And then like he called like code 100, which called like all the officers. Finally, after three weeks in the hole, Valadez says he's given up causing trouble. You can't win with these people. They just have to bow down to these people every now and again because they think they're God. Inmate Shane Tucker is also having a tough time behind bars. Uh, I got a problem with authority. 25-year-old Tucker is charged with a felony DUI. In late 2009, he gets into a beef with an officer while out during rec time. He tries to talk to a fellow inmate who's locked down. I was talking to him through the door, and the guard didn't like that. I'm easily irritated, so I told him, F you. Tucker refuses to cooperate and is taken to the ground. I've been hit with those tasers before. I didn't feel like getting hit this time, so I just pretty much gave up. They took me to the hole. Tucker's been to the hole plenty of times. On rare occasions, inmates go through another kind of exchange. This detainee will be extradited to Florida for a parole violation from a robbery charge. But before 22-year-old inmate Corey Lane gets transferred, he's getting married. Under the watchful eyes of New Century, that will closely record the big day. We see somewhere between five and 10 I would say, uh, weddings in the jail per year that are approved. In this case, Lane's tying the knot with the woman who put him behind bars, longtime girlfriend, Lindsay Piles. She tried to get the charges of domestic violence dropped, but failed. On this night, security is tight. You promise to love and to cherish her, there are strict rules for how the wedding is conducted to prevent couples from passing weapons or contraband. Can't touch or, you know, kiss, hold, hug. Um, basically no contact at all while the wedding takes place except for exchange of rings. That's as far as we'll let it go. Corey, will you take Lindsay to be your wife? Yes, I will. By the power vested in me under the laws of the state of Kansas, I pronounce you husband and wife. <laughs> I'm you know what? Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. We went ahead and did it today, so... Whew. I'm still butterflies from it all. I'm a married man now, you know? Get to have my wife forever, I guess. As Lane returns to his cell, cameras continue to track him. 
With constant surveillance, inmates at New Century have little chance to get away with anything. The deputies who run this facility and use its new technology say this is the wave of the future. I think that a lot of jails around America are probably going to more of the touch screen capabilities. This facility, what it's done is it's literally brought us into the 21st century. The innovations at New Century could someday be put into practice in jails around the country. But despite the technology, the deputies will continue to face the never-ending human challenge of keeping hundreds of inmates under control.